Water was protected at times in this province. This man right here, Ernest Albert Cleveland, who became the first commissioner of the Greater Vancouver Water District, in 1926 to 1952, who protected the watersheds from logging, protected the watersheds from forest companies that kept knocking at the door. He used to be the provincial water controller from 1917 to 1925. In 1922, he wrote a report for the forest minister, Mr. Patala, and he stated very clearly, and he understood it because he was the guy in charge of water for this province. And he said to the ministry, he said that make sure that nobody goes into that watershed and that they don't block that watershed. When, when he became commissioner, he fulfilled that promise. He got a long-term lease of Crown Lands for 999 years. He bought out all the private interests in there to control that watershed for the future well-being of the residents of Greater Vancouver. And then he said, prior to his passing in 1952 in January, just before a bunch of foresters started coming in the door, he said, they will log that watershed over my dead body. And he also said in some correspondence in 1936, he said, neither sterilization nor filtration is required because of the way in which we're protecting our water supply. There has been strong provisions to protect water legislatively in this province. They can still be done. The will of the people needs to be brought forward to combat the decades that we've undergone to think that what's going on in our water supplies is entirely acceptable. made a commitment to protect drinking water from the source to the tap. And that's a broad spectrum. Uh, it was no coincidence that he made that speech at the uh, fall conference at, of the uh, Union of BC Municipalities. Because uh, to make it work, you really have to work with the local authorities. Some of you may know that we had a report by the Auditor General of British Columbia last year. He made a number of recommendations. I believe there may be copies of that report around you might want to have a look at. Uh, we, we are developing now, through these hearings, uh, a 
a water, water protection plan uh, to give um, and put this commitment into law, the commitment that Premier made. So we're here tonight to, uh, to hear you, uh, to listen. This is more in a, a prospect of a public meeting. It's not a political meeting. It's a meeting where I think we want to hear ideas and positive suggestions. Now, we could have come out and, and held meetings without doing a draft plan. But I thought that we should at least put, put our ideas down, and it will be explained to you uh, uh, in a summary form in a few minutes here, uh, that we would put the, uh, some ideas down that we had. Now, it's not written in stone. I heard people say in the radio today, wow, you know, that, that, or this, that. tell us here, and, and we'll listen, and we'll make notes. You can add to it. You can subtract from it. You can, uh, you can give us some suggestions, but please make them concrete. And, and, and make them in good faith, and we'll hear them in good faith. I, um, uh, I just let, let me conclude by saying, it's a strange thing, water. In, uh, it's so essential, and it's, uh, it's being kind of bounced around government. It, it bounced around different ministries, different departments. It's, uh, it, it really hasn't had its, its, its place at the center of the table of land use planning. Uh, but it's time has come. It's absolutely essential to our human health. We can't live without it. So I think this is the time and the place is in the next few months, and I hope that we can get legislation. It's not going to be perfect, uh, but I think it's going to be something, and we need to do it. I'm Singmar Lee and I'm uh, from the Canadian Reforestation and Environmental Workers Society. I'm a tree planter and uh, I'm in my 20th year of, uh, of working in BC. And um, I have a, a bit of a different angle on, on uh, a, a problem that hasn't really been touched on in, in this session here. And it concerns the Nanaimo drinking watershed. And the Nanaimo drinking watershed is a privately owned drinking watershed and it's owned by the giant American logging company, Weyerhaeuser. And uh, from a tree planter's point of view, um, we were, uh, uh, my preamble is similar to the process here, a three quarters preamble and then I'll get to the question. But anyway, um, okay, so uh, we were uh, suffering from these ill effects of handling these industrial chemical fertilizers that were forced into our job description and uh, vomiting, headaches, nosebleeds and this sort of thing. We complained repeatedly to the logging company and uh, they ignored us. So uh, we uh, took it upon ourselves and had this product tested and found it laced with uh, toxic carcinogenic heavy metals, cadmium, chromium, strontium, nickel, and zinc. Further uh, research re uh, discovered that uh, the products were, had ingredients from American uh, industrial waste recyclers and uh, in specifically steel mill smokestack ash, which would indicate for dioxins. And dioxins uh, testing was more expensive than we could raise so far. The, the money is about 2,000 bucks. So that uh, suddenly became an environmental concern because uh, you know, we work quite a bit on the Weyerhaeuser private lands, which uh, constitute a significant chunk of Vancouver Island and 80% of the coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimatic zone. Um, the management of the Nanaimo drinking watershed is a story of hypocrisy and greed and lies. The uh, fertilizer program in the Nanaimo drinking watershed was conducted without the uh, knowledge of the Nanaimo drinking water uh, authorities uh, and also without the knowledge of the BC Auditor General who used uh, the Nanaimo drinking watershed as one of eight case studies. Uh, my freedom of information request revealed that Weyerhaeuser has spread 44 tons of chemical fertilizers in the, behind the gates which protect that drinking watershed since 1998. Now they've spread it on a thousand hectares of clear cuts. And uh, what about these clear cuts since 1998? Now I have a, a Ministry of Forests pamphlet uh, 
uh, that was uh, done about uh, black-tailed deer winter range. And uh, believe it or not, but the black-tailed deer on Vancouver Island are in trouble. And that scientist recommended that three areas inside the Nanaimo drinking watershed be preserved from cutting for the benefit of the deer. And these were about 300 hectares, or it was about 400 hectares of what remained of the forests in that 300 kilometer watershed. Well, immediately the next year, these warehouser foresters went in there and clear cut all, th all four of those 100 hectare chunks. Now, 100 hectares is two and a half times what is allowed by the Forest Practices Code on Crown land. And the Forest Practices Code is supposedly the, the standard by which drinking water is managed on Crown land. So on private lands, these guys just do whatever they want. Now, I'm working my way up the watershed. We've talked about the fertilizers. We've talked about the logging. And finally, the most dastardly act in the management of the Nanaimo drinking watershed is the extinction of the Vancouver Island marmot. And Green Mountain is the summit of the Nanaimo drinking watershed. And in the year 2000, now we've known that the marmots are in trouble for at least 10 or 15 years. In the year 2000, Weyerhaeuser was clear cutting on Green Mountain right in the vicinity of the last 35 Vancouver Island marmots. 90% of the forest cover has been stripped off that watershed. And uh, if anybody d doubts that, please come and see me afterwards. I'll prove it all. I've got everything in my briefcase. Okay, my suggestion, and that's not a question. I have a recommendation. These people have abused that watershed, and it needs to be confiscated. And there's two options. There's expropriation, which the minister has the power to do. And the other one, if you want to be nice to Weyerhaeuser, the tree growing company, then uh, there is a 5% clawback. When Weyerhaeuser bought Macmillan Bladell out of petty cash, by the way, um, there's a requirement that 5% of that purchase gets returned to the people of BC. And that has not happened. The Ministry of Logging has somehow managed to obscure the fact that that 5% is available. I say that 5% will secure the Nanaimo drinking watershed and the Qualicum River drinking watershed and the Ladysmith drinking watersheds from these giant American logging company, which has got only one purpose in that watershed, and that's to log it. And the ecological implications of Weyerhaeuser's legacy in the Nanaimo drinking watershed are just now coming to light, and the Ministry of Environment is in a terrible predicament now because they are also <coughs> culpable for some serious uh, problems. And we're talking like Green Mountain, decline of the fish in the Nanaimo River. Um, you know, it, it's just a nightmare. I mean, I, I flew over the watershed yesterday. You could clearly see a turbidity stream, a turbidity plume flowing into the, the, the back of the Jump Lake Reservoir from a gutted, <coughs> an entirely gutted uh, water course coming into that thing. I mean, it's, I, I, there's massive clear cuts bigger than the 40 acres <coughs> that is not required under public land. So, if this needs, and, and I'm not hearing anything about the precautionary principle. I listened through a whole day of, uh, of, uh, of um, discussions here. And precautionary principle is not mentioned. When we're talking drinking water, no risk is acceptable. No amount of chemicals is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Some have expressed surprise that a church group would uh, host such an event, and I'd just like to very briefly explain that. Uh, Unitarians uh, are generally, uh, by nature, involved uh, in social action, many of them are. And 
and in the NIMO group there's no exception. This venue tonight is one where we have not taken a position, preferring to remain independent and in the process hope we make it, hopefully make the event more successful. We're hoping to make this less threatening and therefore encourage communication between the various factions. The concern for safe drinking water is front and centre across this nation. You can't turn on a radio or TV without seeing it discussed. The SEER Legal Defence Fund recently released a report which ranked BC as a D, opposed to Ontario with its Walkerton disaster, as a B, and the USA as an A. Understandably, people are concerned. Um, the last figure I heard was that for the oil water advisories there was something over 200 in BC alone. Now if I'm wrong about that, I'm sure there'll be someone here who will correct me. Uh, the figure may have been revised, I don't know. But uh, if it is right, then it certainly sounds third world. One wise member on this committee that I've been working with said, we need water for life, we need good water for good life. We understand that on an issue as important and basic as this, the passions run high. If this passion is tempered with respect, then tonight we may start to achieve something. Uh, the organizing committee cast a very wide net uh, in an attempt to gather people for this panel. Uh, we, want, we were looking to get balanced opinions. And that turned out to be much more difficult than anticipated. What we've ended up with, in fact, is a good news, bad news scenario. And I think you'll understand better in a moment. Among those asked to participate were our watershed's owners, Warehouser. They declined to attend. That's bad news. The good news is that they've probably got observers here tonight. Our water purveyors, the city of Nanaimo, declined to be on the panel because that's bad news. But the good news is that they are here tonight. Well, Mr. Chairman, I've come over from Salt Spring. My two grandchildren live in Nanaimo. And as a grandfather, a caring grandfather, I'm concerned about uh, the water they're drinking. And I'm puzzled because. I understand that the watersheds of Vancouver and Victoria have tremendous protection. You don't even have to walk in those watersheds. And yet I come here and I hear what's going on here and I want to know why and I want some answers. But before I do that, I'd like to say that this business of some of the stakeholders, the Water Authority, the logging company, whoever it is, not being up there and participating in this forum is rather astonishing to me. And I'd just like to say it's like it's like going to a wedding and hearing that the bridegroom would rather sit in the audience uh, as an observer and watch the, well, watch the ceremony. That's what's going on. What's wrong with these people? Are they frightened to give an answer? Are they admitting guilt? Uh, is the one here, Mr. McKenzie, is he here? He said he would sit this one out. He's the manager of the water company here. Are you here, Mr. McKenzie? Yeah. Would you mind telling everybody here, including me, why you're not up there? What's the reason? I'd like to know. Come on. You're not scared, are you? I was sitting, listen, I come from Salt Spring. How was I sitting up? Why can't you stand up and tell me, a grandparent, a caring grandparent, why you're not part of this? I just like to know. Obviously, he can. He's, it would say. Could you direct your question now? All right, well, I'll just have to say this again. He must be feeling some guilt for this. Thank you very much. I, it, it's eloquent by his silence. More good news is that Dr. Fred Rockwell, who heads the Central Vancouver Island Health Region, is attending. Uh, right here. Thank you, Dr. Rockwell. Bad news is that four hours ago, the Ministry of Environment, Lands and Parks, who said that we're attending, opted out. The good news is that they, uh, I believe, sincerely intended to be here but the Kamloops meeting has taken their experts away and it appears that there was a communication mix up 
between the Victoria office where the request was put in and down the Nyman office. I believe it was a genuine oversight by Bruce Palisway, uh, uh, Palisway sorry, uh, from uh, the Nyman's First Nation. Uh, they were invited uh, to be on the panel. They said they would be very happy to be here as observers and they're here tonight. The Sierra Legal Defense Fund were invited, but they are really, really busy at the moment and they were able to get anybody here, as far as I know. Uh, because of these no shows, we've added uh, Mike Steen. Uh, Mike. Down here, a uh, man with intimate knowledge of our watershed. Tonight, we have something to ask of you. Hopefully, there should be lots of opportunity for you, ask, for you to ask questions and briefly state your views. What we ask of you is to continue that truly Canadian attribute of respect. Uh, we added Mike at the last moment because we had so uh, we had some dropouts the last moment. So he is surprisingly enough uh, an ungulate specialist. And apparently, an ungulate I found out is uh, an animal that has, has hooves. And uh, there's only two on the island: that's the deer and the elk. <laughs> but the reason he's here is that he. He does, um, he knows the watershed intimately because he's been up there studying these animals. So I think he'll be able to, I think he'll be a good resource for us tonight. He does wildlife assessment under contract uh, to the Ministry of the Environment, Lands and Parks. He works with them reviewing forest development plans. Tonight's focus of this meeting is on water quality and uh, and the reason um, that there's threats to the water quality and uh, the main reason as a, what I can see is that uh, there's a lack of law um, governing what uh, activities occur on uh, private forest land. Okay. Is this, is this better? Yep. Okay. Um, okay, I'd just like to inform people that it's not only water that is affected by uh, poor forestry but it's also wildlife habitat. Um, we need to realize that water, fish and wildlife are all connected and interdependent. Um, for an example, if a, a steep south facing slope um, which is deer wind range habitat is logged, um, this affects uh, the the water runoff on this hill that affects the siltation, the, um, the water um, warms more rapidly because the forest cover is removed. Um, so there's a number of effects that, that happen and if, uh, if we're looking out for the wildlife then obviously um, it, it improves our water quality too because the, the water is filtered through all the the mosses and the soils on those hillsides. Um, so I was just um, thinking that if, if we're going to push for changes in regulations, um, let's make sure that we uh, look at the whole ecosystem and not just focus on a single part because it's it's all all interdependent. Um, from uh, my experience, uh, the rate of cut is the, the single most important factor in the forest because um, everything is affected by this. If uh, if you have too high a rate of cut, um, there's there's pressure to, to remove um, you know critical wildlife habitat. There's uh, pressure to uh, to remove riparian areas. So if you have a slower rate of cut, um, the forest is older. Um, like in California, they have a law where uh, you can't cut a tree that's um, younger than 120 years old. So, and here the government has just changed the law that uh, allows trees to be cut at uh, 50 years. Um, so, so that's something that we should all be uh, aware of. Um, and with these shorter rotations, it means that the, the landscape is always in an immature forest and the, the forest uh, just can't recover back to, to what it's naturally supposed to be. 
Um, and then the Nama River, um, this, this watershed has been severely over harvested. Um, there, uh, I have a poster up on the wall there that shows, um, well I have another one here, but it, it shows these, um, these large areas that, that were uh, identified as winter range and, uh, and by government and industry studies and now they're all gone, they're logged. So, uh, and this is what's happening on uh, private land all over Vancouver Island. It's still happening, and um, there needs to be some laws to change that. Warning. Warning. One more minute. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's a pretty well, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say. If uh, people have any questions later on, um, uh, like I said earlier, my specific knowledge is on uh, on winter range, and uh, this this is a picture of black-tailed deer eating the boreal lichen, which uh, is a critical food source that allows them to survive the winter because it's uh, highly digestible and it allows them to digest. Um, the branches from the trees, which is the only food source they have in the winter when there's, uh, the snows are so deep that all the, the, um, all the other plants are buried. So, um, But anyway, I guess if there's any questions on that later, we can go into that. So I guess that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.
And is this the kind of forestry that you want to see going on in your watershed? I mean, we're already seeing warehouses are cutting 30 and 40 year old second growth. They're, the uh, fodder bunches are at this moment marching towards the Nanaimo watershed to do the second palace. Uh, the Nanaimo watershed was intact in 1955. That's when the first logging started. What is going on on the private lands is, is quite shocking. And what is going on in the Nanaimo watershed is shocking. As Mike has said, in 1998, the Ministry of Forests identified three areas in the watershed that were uh, suitable for deer winter range. And th these are, are, I can show you on our, our Ministry of Forest pamphlet, that these have been recommended to be preserved and retained for the benefit of the deer populations. Well, 1999, they were all clear cut. And we're talking 100 hectare clear cuts. Uh, 40 hectares is the maximum clear cut size that's permissible on Crown land. But because it's private land, these guys just do whatever they want in there. What do this is the uh, this is the mentality that is guiding the management of the Nanaimo drinking watershed. The final outrage is the unfortunate uh, story of the Vancouver Island marmot. There are at the moment uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 35 marmots living up on uh, Green Mountain, which is the summit of the Nanaimo drinking watershed. And we've known that the marmots were in trouble for at least 10 or 15 years. Yet, in the year 2000, Weyerhaeuser was still clear-cutting on Green Mountain, right in the vicinity of the, these uh, marmots' habitat. And it's quite clear from the charts and the graphs that you can see that that marmot, the Vancouver Island marmot, will be extinct in the wild in the next couple of years. So do you want industrial waste in your drinking watershed? Do you want this kind of rotation, cyclical, corporate plantation model in your drinking watershed. I call it Frankenfiber Farms. Uh, the, the, the whole push is fertilizers, growth promoters, growth retardants. Uh, I'm still trying to get the information uh, about the pesticide program in the drinking watershed, if in fact there is one, but they have not provided that information on the uh, uh, FOIs that I put in. Uh, and genetic engineered uh, trees. Weyerhaeuser is very much into uh, genetic engineering uh, of uh, trees, and it's uh, a big part of their R&D program. So these are the questions that I'm trying to raise. Um, so there's my three minutes. Thank you.
And that's why the legislation was once in place in British Columbia to protect our drinking water. It was, it was quite explicit in the legislation whereby um, in the Forest Act passed in 1912 that there were forest reserves set aside for our drinking water for the perpetual growing of timber in their own, for the water supply, and the prevention of human trespass because these people understood because they were raised in tradition over hundreds of years or by the, the stories in the New Testament and other religions in this world influenced their thinking. And they really had a good, strong land ethic. And what happened in the 1950s was very interesting as the big corporations came to British Columbia here is they influenced provincial government's legislation. So what they did was they, uh, they neglected, they purposely neglected the legislation which protected your drinking supply, and then they covered it up. And just as there was no logging in the Niagara watershed in the mid-1950s, I looked at those series of, of forest cover maps, and what progressed from 1955 into the present is part of a plan that was in place by the industry for decades to log your drinking watersheds. And so we can go and look at drinking watersheds throughout this province and we can see why the rise of public criticism and debate and frustration in the 1960s led to the first task force, the provincial task force to examine drinking watersheds in this province. And unfortunately, that task force redefined two things in the public's thinking. One, it redefined what the word protection was. It was protection for business, all right? And it also redefined what a watershed reserve was. A watershed reserve was once what meant that these places were set, of, set aside from human development and industry. Now, watershed reserves meant something that's reserved for industry. So, part of my experience in, in researching, doing, um, do lobbying, the, our, our municipal, municipal politicians going to public meetings for nine years, over the course of my doing this research, I began to really understand what's going on here. And I think this is something that's locked within your municipality as well are the close ties with industry and your politicians. And I think that's something very important for the people of Nanaimo need to get together, not only to do the research and the history of what's happening in your drinking watersheds, but to come to a place to a forum where you can tackle these issues and, and you can say that we've had enough because from what I've seen what's going on in your, in your watershed and from the experiences that we've had, I think that, that you and everybody else needs to get together in this province to understand what the problems are. And so, a couple of days ago at the, at the last forum uh, in, uh, in Vancouver, we brought a petition forward to the, to the minister, Ian, uh, Ian Waddell. The question I have for the government is that for some strange reason, we came from an era where these places were set aside and understood for, for protection of the water supply, and look what's going on in this province right now. So my question is, why has the government not presented the information on the, on the change in legislation from what we were to where we are today? And in this respect, we would like to present the Minister, Mr. Waddell, with a petition from 24 groups so far in this province asking that watershed reserves be legislated to protect people's drinking water supplies from resource use activities. So maybe somebody could pass this forward to the Minister. In the space of four days, we've had um, about 40 groups sign on to petition to bring about legislation as a province to protect our drinking watersheds from resource exploitation. 
And uh, there is a growing awareness in this particular province, not only from the Walkerton thing, not only from the Auditor General's report, from the cumulative experiences and frustrations that people have had over 30 years in this province. And we've had to put up with the kind of propaganda that's been put forward to us that we should accept the degradation of our water supply in this province. So um, that's all I have to say for now. Who's a journalist and photographer, a local person, and along with um, Ingmar, has been uh, another person who's raised concerns about the work in this area. Uh, Raymond Parker, uh, I'm an independent journalist and I live and work here in Nanaimo. Uh, I've written for local newspapers here uh, at one time and uh, magazines across the country. Um, a lot of the, the, the nitty gritty. Uh, of this issue has been covered by um, the other panelists here. So I thought I'd just concentrate on what my experience has been with this issue as a journalist. Um, fertilizers affect tree planters. That was the first headline to touch on this issue uh, last February. It was in the Times Colonist on February the 19th. And it outlined concerns raised by Ingmar Lee. At that point, I've been doing research on the management of our watershed for some time, about six, eight months, and um, <clears throat> I had questions of my own, and they, are, and they are, and still remain in a nutshell. Firstly, is the convergence of genetically engineered trees and associated intensive silvicultural practices, uh, Franklin forests, environmentalists like to refer to the biotech gold rush in the woods, and forest community water safety testing isn't compatible under the same roof as within the confines of BC Research, the company retained to test Nanaimo's water. And they're also the authors of the Greater Nanaimo Watershed Fertilizer Risk Assessment that was uh, released in December. Secondly, what is the priority of the provincial government uh, moving towards protection of drinking water sources as the Auditor General? report strongly urged in 1999, or is it the maximum of the projected annual allowable cut as laid out by the recent uh, Ministry of Forests incremental silvicultural strategy that recommends increased inputs of genetically engineered trees and fertilizers um, in order to stave off the presently unsustainable rate of cut, annual level cut in the province. And lastly, why was it necessary to, quote, keep the watershed low key, unquote, as was suggested to me by a greater than I'm a watershed manager at the very start of my investigations. A month after the Times Colonist, a headline in a local newspaper here in town um, ventured Testing refutes water contamination fears, referring to the regular sampling uh, that's done by BC Research. At the same time, I offered my examination of the issues surrounding the watershed as a possible serialized essay to local newspapers or to a uh, distilled, excuse the pun, uh, op ed length version of my findings. No one was interested. Ingmar, however, I believe was able to uh, publish some of his key concerns again in the Times Colonist in Victoria. Um, I pressed on through the summer as the horrors unfolded in Walkerton and was finally informed by the editor of uh, Nanaimo's Daily that, quote, his newspaper would not be uh, used as a forum for environmentalists. Lucky for you, a story slipped by that editor's desk and, well, as you know, the fertilizer hit the fan. The city was inundated with calls. The $4,500 BC research report was released in December. And uh, the aforementioned editor was able to write, Water Fears Quench. This for me and other journalists who felt the fallout from the story has become one of the key parts of this issue, the foot dragging by the media and by public officials who were determined to suppress the issue by branding legitimate concerns as, quote, despicable fear mongers. Uh, thank you, Gary.
perhaps will be proven wrong to worry, and we can all go back to watching the soap operas. But we know that in Walkerton, not enough people were asking questions. Thank you. My name is Curtis Aguirre. I'm a resident of Nanaimo. Um, I'm not sure who to address this to. Uh, Will Cope, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, and Raymond Parker, but uh, could you clar could someone clarify uh, for me the legal, the current legal status of the watersheds in BC, the designated watersheds? Who has jurisdiction over them? Uh, what kind of jurisdiction is that? Uh, in other words, what kind of control do they actually have, wherever they are, and um, how did private land come to be in watersheds? So, so whoever can be. Can I'll, I'll, I'll take the first part. Um, as regards the uh, Nanaimo watershed, uh, it's owned block, stock, and barrel by Warehouser. Uh, it's part of the ENN grant grants that's been passed down from uh, from from various uh, various companies through through the years, uh, from the uh, railroad barons, coal barons, and uh, and the lumber bosses. Um, as far as the protections on the private lands, like the Nimos. As the Auditor General pointed out in 1999, um, they're not subject to the Forest Practices Code, which the Auditor General pointed out were important tools for water protection, quote unquote. So we don't have those here. Uh, we rely on the ethical uh, mindset of, of the corporation. So, so the Nanaimo watershed has no sort of legal existence. Um, it's simply somebody's land. It's someone's land, land. But, but, but there are, you know, there's, there still are supposed to be laws in the province that can be brought to bear. Um, but like in uh, many of the other uh, public lands, uh, they're not used very often. I'll hand uh, the rest of that over to Will. I can't. You can't quote me on what the powers of the, the Premier and the Minister of Forests have over these, some of these private forest lands. There, there are others that know more about this. But generally speaking, if, if we look at the land tenure system in, in, in the province of British Columbia, there are, there's a minor amount of federal land. The bulk of it is called Crown land. 6% or something is private land. Uh, of course, mixing that now is the Delta Loop decision. That seems to be moving our, um, our thinking in, in another arena entirely. And that leaves the question over the, the future decision and ethics of the First Nations uh, on, in their own capacity everywhere. But simply speaking, we, we, we can look historically about, uh, over the legislation about what, how things get determined in here, what the rules and regulations and laws are. I can describe to you quite generally that that, that there, were, there were strong protection measures at one time that, 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 that looked at, for instance, water. But there were a lot of people that abused it. And, it's, and, it's, and these things, if you look over time about how people got settled here, how the laws were instituted, who were they were instituted for, usually for special interests. And those special interests increased, especially in the 1950s, because most of the land here is, uh, is, is, is is for the undertaking of removing wood. So those those laws and legislations changed. It changed in a very specific manner in the 1950s. So in the 1960s, we had the public sustainable units, 78 of them that were throughout this province to devise the allowable and cut on provincial forest lands. And so through through the decades, there's been changes in the legislation, for instance, of lands and forests. It was once lands and his lands and forests, and his lands, forests, and water resources. Then it was then the Ministry of Forests was established in 1976, and and, and, and divorced itself from from the from the uh, um, the adhesion it once had with, with those other ministries. 
And as that progressed, so the legislation progressed to, to, to strengthen the interests that are there on the provincial land base up to this present time right now where we have the minister right now on uh, election time about to hand over a lot of power to the forest companies. But the, the whole question relates to what water is, what water is for our drinking supply, what, what, what it is for the fish, what, what it is for the, for the water regulation over time, what it is for our hydroelectric dams you know, that you know, they're logging the heck out of, out of them behind the scenes. Now they're worried about, about a climatic change and, and, and low snowpack. And yet the, the whole uh, practice over the years, as the timber industry and as the government has known what the effects of logging, an accelerated amount of logging would be in this province, it's, it's impacting our collective stream systems in this province. So there, there, there is, as the judge defined just recently for the Red Mountain Residents Association in Hasty Creek, under the Forest Practices Code Act and under the, under the Forest Act, citizens have no right to water and it's the Ministry of Forests right now who have the upper level and power, discretionary powers what goes on on our land base, crown lands. And, and so what is needed is that those powers have to be taken away from them and have to be brought into another system. And that's part of the new social contract that we need to enter into. My name is Phil Carson. I'm with the neighbors of a little call on River in Palm Beach. And uh, I'd first like to thank the church for putting this on. And I'd like to speak to, to ethics as uh, an area that uh, the churches tend to specialize in. And to also to the concept of uh, intellectual honesty and integrity. My question relates to intellectual integrity. You know about endocrine disruptors, you know about the dangers of these kind of toxins. Why would you stand in front of a, a, a room like this and tell us that it's safe to be putting these things in our drinking water? That's my question. I didn't say that it was safe to put anything in our drinking water. What I said is that I believe, based on by review of the information that's available, that our drinking water is safe, and I stand by that. Mr. Rockwell, you said, according to the Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines, our water quality was excellent. Would you really say that, sir? If our water quality was excellent, would we even be here? I think it's really time as people to get into a true democratic society, which means that we vote on issues and take the power back into the hands of the people. And most people are good and we would know what the right thing is to do. One other little thing, one other little thing you said, uh, Mr. Dr. Rockwell, you said with a little care, everything would be all right. Would you explain please what kind of care you would suggest? The, um, the reason I think people are here tonight is not because they believe the water is crappy, because they're concerned about what they've read in the paper and they're worried that the water may not be good. That's what they are And I, I stand by what I said, the water quality in the Nile is excellent. And I said that with, uh, I don't remember the exact words, but with, with some care, I see no reason why it shouldn't continue to, to be very good and some of the things that have been suggested tonight. We need to, it's obvious that the science is there to tell us for sure if there's a problem with putting the fertilizer in the watershed, when, when, we'd be, when we would be able to detect it, for example. So what we need to do is to look at improving the monitoring, look at other ways that perhaps maybe we don't have to use fertilizer, I shouldn't say we were, Maybe there are alternate ways to achieve the same result without using the fertilizer, looking at other ways of doing the same thing. I don't know. 
One of the concerns I have about the way the discussion seems to be going tonight is that we are focusing in on uh, the risks, real and perceived risks, about the use of fertilizers in the watershed and other activities. Earlier on tonight, uh, uh, Mr. Steen mentioned that we need to take uh, an ecosystem approach to this problem. We need to not only look at the water quality, but to look at the species diversity, the animals and the plants in the area, because they all have an impact on the water quality. My background is in population health, and as part of that training, we're trying to take an ecosystem approach to health, and not just to look at health as you know, doctors and hospitals, but to look at health as, as the result of an interaction of a number of factors called health determinants. Health services is one of them, yes. Uh, our human biology is another. So are the things that we do, our lifestyles, uh, the uh, capacities that we have. The physical environment, water we drink, the food we eat, also have an impact on health, as does the social and economic environment. And my concern is that if we focus in only on the risk and try at all costs to get that risk down as close to zero as possible, what we may be giving up in the process may have an even greater harmful impact on health. So my plea would be to take a balanced approach to this. Yes, there, there is some uncertainty, and yes, we need to be careful, but we have to be even more careful if we don't go overboard in the pursuit of the Holy Grail called zero risk. Well, I think when we get down to our water, we should go overboard. Excuse me. Yeah. Could I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Next speaker. Yeah. 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 I'd, like I'd like to make a comment, and this is a fair comment, and a bunch of them like this. And this, this particular moment, I'm reminded of what the chaplain said when he was looking at the atomic bomb going off and how beautiful it was. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm rather disturbed at what I'm hearing in a way here. And, and I've heard this before. I, I, I know there's a division within, with, uh, within the medical health profession for those who advocate for the, the economy and the health of the people in, in reaping the profits and destroying your watersheds. And, uh, I, and the, the, the point that the lady brought up about, about what we can do, like the Sunshine, in the Sunshine Coast Regional District, they held a referendum on May the 2nd, 1998, where 87.6% of the voters that turned out rejected logging and future mining in their watersheds. And the, the regional district representatives went to the government and the government has refused to listen to them. Well, this brings me back to what the other person was saying. How are we going to solve these problems if the government right now is saying it wants to protect your water, but it's not sincere at all about what it's doing? There's so many contradictions here. There, there's this whole philosophy that's been developed to advocate the, the ruination of your water. And there's a whole part of science that's been manipulated to let you think that everything's so wonderful. The risk analysis, yeah. I, there's, there's something deeply troubling me here. And, and I see the contradictions, and I think we need to iron these things out. And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not satisfied with what I'm hearing here. And uh, we, we need to come together to, to, to grasp what the real issues are. Thanks. In the case of our situation in Nanaimo, I think, I'm, I'm so sorry that there seems to be an adversarial relationship between our water commissioner wanting to have a low profile. It shouldn't be that way. The water district of Nanaimo will stand to benefit hugely if, and we all will, if legislation could be passed that gives us control over our water so we don't have to ship it to uh, California, so we don't have to have chemistry experiments performed on us without our permission and without even our knowledge and so on. But So the question is how can we get involved politically and how can we put the heat on us politicians? I think, you know, just in the Nanaimo uh, situation that there's some 
some uh, really uh, easy solutions just to gain control of the watershed. And the first one is perhaps uh, controversial. I just believe that it's unacceptable that a giant American corporation uh, controls our drinking water. And our, our uh, superintendent of the water board here says that he's powerless to ask them not to use these chemicals in the watershed because it's private land. I say that's ridiculous. If he's in charge and responsible for our drinking water, surely he can write them a letter and say, I don't want this in my watershed. Now, uh, one of the solutions that I would like to see, because, you know, Weyerhaeuser has made this uh, an extremely unpleasant experience for me to bring these concerns. Uh, I think it should be expropriated. The government has the power to do that, and they should just... <laughs> there's, there's one other thing. Is that uh, when uh, Weyerhaeuser bought McMillan Bodell, uh, out of petty cash, by the way, um, <laughs> they, uh, there was a requirement that 5% of that land base gets clawed back and is re uh, returned to uh, the you know small business or First Nations or or uh, other interests uh, such as watershed. So I mean, Weyerhaeuser should they owe us 5% of that land base, which would cover the quality. Uh, Watershed and the Nanaimo watershed and the Ladysmith watershed and you know I mean uh, it, it, that we don't there's no money involved and then you know there's uh, the six billion dollar stoppage mm -hmm. ripoff so there's no reason to there's no expense. In Excuse me, uh, I see quite a few people standing. I would like to shorten this. Uh, oh. Question back before the answer. Well, I think I think that there's very there's this very important issue that's being raised here, and it has to do with forging a new social contract. The thing that brings us all together because we're here for one purpose together. I think that the Unitarian Church understands this because it's part of their belief system. And how are we going to do this? And before I do that, I'm just going to tell you very quickly what the Minister of Forests has just been put, put together a proposal for the working forest. He wants to dedicate the rest of the lands outside of public parks in this province to the working forest. The government has just said that it wants to protect your water supplies in this province. What it hasn't told you, it's now dedicated your watersheds to the working forest. Okay, so they have a contradiction. Now they have to come forward and say this, but let's get on to the social contract. Part of the social contract deals with the future of us all living together. That's, that's private lands, that's crown lands, that's getting all together with First Nations to describe about how we're going to be living together. And if you are a private landowner, as Weyerhaeuser now is, you, as a, as, as a corporate citizen, as a person on this earth, need to live together with other people, need to respect each other. So what they're doing up there, they should be giving that watershed to you because they would value your future. Now that's part of the social contract, I think, when we're living together and sharing things together. So, we have to come together and do this thing properly, I think. And I think that together, people, not only in this province, people in this country, people in this world have to come together for a new social contract. That's the only way that you're going to fight things on a local level, on a national level, and on an international level. Thank you. Thanks.